I don't need to tell you that there is a currently a global economic crisis on. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is that about the crisis and uh, its impact, particularly on uh, two of the largest economies of the world, namely India and China. Now, this is particularly uh, relevant in this context because uh, about five years ago or so, if you read the literature, you see the notion expressed that India and China have broken off, have decoupled from the rest of the world, and they are they're growing rapidly on their own steam. And uh, well, what happens in the rest of the world is not so important for them, but they will have an impact on the rest of the world's growth. So that was the decoupling notion. Now all that was uh, put under doubt and thrown away by the financial crisis. And we will see in a moment, India and China are no exceptions to be influenced by what has been happening. Now, what I want to do is uh, uh, to talk about briefly about possible contributory causes of the crisis, and then move on to the impact of crisis on India and China, and conclude with uh, a few observations as to where uh, we see the global economy going, and what sort of uh, reforms that you might expect to see. Now, I want to uh, start with the crisis as we all know, the crisis originated in the United States. And uh, more precisely, it uh, uh, started with the uh, collapse of the housing price bubble, which had been building up for some time. Now, the initial spread of the housing price collapse was first to the US financial markets and then to the global financial markets. And from financial markets uh, back to the uh, real economy by way of uh, recession in the United States and then recession globally. So you start with a crisis or collapse, the price bubble collapse in a real sector, namely the real estate. It spreads to the financial sector. And then uh, uh, it spreads to the in the U.S. and then spreads to the rest of the world. Then from financial sector back to the real sector and again spreading to the rest of the world. So that's the uh, 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 that's the interesting analytical question. Uh, what is the linkage between real and the financial sector? Why do you see it manifesting itself in the way? that it has manifested itself now. Now, I had a slide earlier uh, primarily oriented towards my economists and finance colleagues uh, uh, the bemoaning the fact none of the models that we have come anywhere near close to uh, providing a analytical handle to look at this changing real and financial sector linkages and how that is affecting uh, uh, the world now. But I, since I'm presenting to you students here, let me not go back into that story. So taking the dimensions of the crisis, I want to start with the remark that even as of today, which is April 20th, 2009, we still don't know what is the full extent of the crisis in the United States. And uh, there is still, uh, there is some expectation, there are some shoes waiting to fall, and, uh, and so on. So there is uncertainty about whether we have seen most of the uh, dimensions of this uh, crisis already, or still more bad news uh, uh, to come. Okay? That you should keep in mind that the knowledge is not complete. Now, 
I start with the real network, uh, household net worth. And you see here uh, a major meltdown from a $52 trillion of household net worth. As of uh, 2007, uh, it had fallen to $41 trillion. Probably it is still uh, less than $41 billion, but not much uh, less than $41 billion, uh, uh, $41 trillion as of now. So the $12 trillion meltdown out of uh, uh, the 50 or so trillion dollars of initial uh, net worth is substantial. Nearly a uh, uh, quarter of the uh, wealth of the households has been wiped away. So naturally, this will have an impact on household behavior, about consumption, about savings, about you name it, the whole uh, uh, host of things in the economy that are affected by households participation in the economy. The next uh, line tells you the uh, impact on real GDP growth. Now, uh, r r US GDP growth had begun declining even before the financial crisis uh, started. After all, the real estate price bubble uh, reached its peak in the middle of 2006. And so the meltdown after the price uh, bubble collapse, which is felt in the household uh, uh, net worth, had already begun to uh, affect uh, the US GDP growth. So 2007, it had come down to 2%. Now 2008, it is estimated uh, 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 to have been 1.1. But what we know is the last quarter of 2008, it had dipped to minus 6.2%. Now, uh, running the clock forward, uh, uh, the forecast for 2009, that is this year, is the blue chip forecast is the recovery is going to start in the uh, second or third quarter of 2009. And by the end of 2009, in the fourth quarter, the GDP will be growing at 1.8%. Remember, these are forecasts based on information that was available about a month ago. And as I said, we still don't know whether the full dimensions of the crisis uh, have been revealed. And so you have to take this forecast blue chip or otherwise with a huge uh, pillar of salt. Now, the most uh, uh, directly affecting uh, household statistic is uh, uh, unemployment rate. And we know the uh, March data that was announced uh, a couple of weeks ago showed an unemployment rate of 5.1%. And the projection is that the unemployment rate will go up to 8.9. My suspicion is perhaps it will be even uh, uh, higher than that. But once again, I don't need to tell you that unemployment rate is a lagging, uh, sorry, a lagging indicator. Now, even after the other segments of the economy have uh, revived, in particular, uh, once the National Bureau of Economic Research pronounces that the recession is over, recovery starts, it still takes a year or longer for uh, uh, unemployment to go back to the previous level. So uh, it is likely that uh, the unemployment rate will go even further than what I have uh, said here. Now, stock prices index, you all should know as being in the business school. The Dow Jones I put down uh, on April 9. April 20 is below that. It's about uh, 7,000. As of last uh, time I saw it, about 7,900 or so. Now, uh, the range for the whole year is also I've given here. And compared to the lowest point of the range, which was some time ago, the recovery thus far 
has been about 25 percent, but uh, compared to the high point, uh, the recovery is only uh, 0 0.6 uh, the ratio, and uh, uh, so 40 percent meltdown relative to the peak. And uh, the other indices, S&P 500 or NASDAQ, do not show that much of a different uh, picture. Now, how about the global dimension of it? Now, you have the output growth rates from uh, uh, from the uh, IMF. Now, from a 3.2% global growth rate uh, of uh, 2008, the IMF projects for 2009 a decline uh, of world output by anywhere between half a percent to 1%. Now, in the advanced economies, uh, the decline is going to be even larger, three and half, three to three and a half percent. The emerging economies, of which China and uh, uh, India are the two major ones, and of course there are Brazil, there is Russia, there are other relatively smaller compared to India and China uh, economies. They were growing in 2008 at a nice clip of 6%, 6 percent, 6.1 percent. And now 2009, that growth is going to go down according to IMF to 1.5 to 2.5. The recovery in 2010 is, as you can see, is relatively uh, anemic compared to where we started out from in 2008. What is more, the world export growth. After all, we talk about globalization and the integration of developing countries into the global world markets and particularly the emerging economies, how this globalization contributed to their uh, rapid growth. Now, this uh, uh, engine of uh, growth, global growth, namely uh, globalization through exports, that is faltering. Now, uh, from a growth of 6% in 2007, came down to 2% in 2008. 2009, the World Trade Organization predicts that it's going to go down by 9%. So that engine uh, is faltering. What's more, some of the developing countries have been depending upon capital flows, the integration in the capital uh, dimension, the capital market dimension. And that again uh, uh, has uh, melted down. So that's the uh, di dimension of the, as of now, of the crisis in the U.S. and the world. Now, quickly going over the contributory causes, causes to the crisis, I have mentioned the collapse of the house price bubble. Now, home prices have fallen by. Uh, nearly 30 percent from the peak, sales down by three quarters from July 2005 peak, and so on, foreclosures up, uh, etc. Now, uh, uh, it's clear uh, we haven't seen the bottom of the housing crisis yet. Uh, if you go by some of the, uh, the predictions or projections, of uh, people like my former colleague at Yale, Nouriel Rubini, who is known as Dr. Doom in, uh, in those who watch television shows. Uh, he expects uh, the housing price to bottom out at about 45% uh, fall from, from the peak. So we have reached only uh, uh, up to 30% now. So still 15% more to go. So, and the uh, foreclosure uh, dimension is increasing uh, day by day. So, uh, uh, bottom line is the housing crisis has not bottomed out. And if you go back, if that is the origin of the whole meltdown, now until and unless the problem at the root uh, is uh, in some sense under control, uh, the, there may be uh, some uh, good reasons for wondering whether uh, uh, the crisis will say, turn around pretty soon. Now, I have already mentioned 
the uh, spread of the crisis from the real sector of real estate to financial sector globally etc now what is the reason for that now uh, this uh, of the six uh, contributory crosses one is before the crisis hit we had an era of high liquidity low interest rates and increasing leverage in financial markets okay now this era of high liquidity uh, in fact uh, and low interest rates in fact started out after the uh, stock uh, the uh, the tech uh, stock boom collapsed in 2001 and our friend who was in uh, federal reserve chair uh, uh, alan greenspan brought the interest rates down the federal funds rate down as far as 1.1% and so the uh, us interest rates followed and the global interest rates had also fallen and the gdp growth was rising around the world then the volatility in the growth had uh, come down so all and china in the meantime uh, was growing at a fair 12% rate of growth in gdp and accumulating uh, uh, current account surpluses initially with uh, uh, with uh, the us but then uh, uh, later around uh, across the world it, it was uh, its uh, trade current account was in surplus now this era has been described by ken rogoff uh, who is at harvard now who was at imf as a great era of great moderation now this lulled many people into thinking that the past business cycles uh, uh, the up and down uh, movements in interest rates as well as all over now we are in a new era everything is going to be low interest rates uh, low volatility high growth etc now the second is the within the us real estate uh, uh, side uh, the regulatory measures on mortgage lending uh, and they had been relaxed and this gave birth to subprime mortgages and also independently of that derivatives such as credit default swaps which were outside the regulatory framework uh, of federal reserve sec and so on in fact uh, uh, in 1995 or so uh, my memory serves me right a legislation explicitly exempted derivatives such as credit default swaps from Uh, regulation and there was a push towards lending to low and middle income households ostensibly to correct for the earlier uh, discrimination against low income household but it went beyond that there were quotas on how much of the lending should go to uh, low and uh, uh, middle income households uh, etc and the fannie mae and freddie mac uh, uh, also engaged in uh, purchase of uh, some of the loans which mortgage loans which they would not have purchased in an earlier era so the emergence of subprime mortgages is due to all these uh, reasons and one of the most egregious ones uh, is the option arm how many of you have heard about option arm from here raise your hand just so few you should learn about this this option arm essentially meant you didn't have to put down any money down payment on getting a house it is optional how much you put down as down payment and it is optional how much the how you service that uh, uh, loan either so the uh, what this meant is uh, uh, the one side uh, the winning bet uh, for example if you had not put down any money and you bought a house uh, on a mortgage and the housing prices went up then re- you can refinance the mortgage and uh, uh, take out some money to co- take treat it as a 
the ATM and consume away that accumulated capital gain and you could do that. But if the prices went south, you can just walk off. You didn't have any equity in that house anyway and you can left the uh, ledger holding the bag. Okay? This one-sided bet was created by a, a option uh, uh, ERM. And the more uh, other things, all kinds of shady characters entered, including shady banking, entered this mortgage market compared to the old-fashioned uh, the banks as the only originators. Now, the most important, in my view, is the securitization and tranching of these mortgages. What this meant, this is an innovation which had a very uh, uh, good upside potential, but that is that was what was uh, thought of at that time. Nobody thought of the downside risk associated with that. The upside potential is obvious. If you pool a whole bunch of uh, uh, mortgages with uh, idiosyncratic risks about uh, their uh, servicing, by this pooling, you are diversifying. You are lowering the uh, lowering the risk. Okay. And second thing, by tranching, that is to say, you're slicing it up uh, into packages. One package with had a low risk, low return at the other end with a high risk, high return like an equity into and sold them off. Then what that meant is the risk, reduced risk was allocated according to capacity to bear risk. So these are uh, nice aspects of the securitization and branching. But what was not uh, 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 the downside part of it that was not realized. If the risk was not idiosyncratic, uh, that could be diversi diversified away, but it was common risk, uh, then everybody is going to be in the same boat. So you are not going to achieve much of a reduction in risk by diversification. And the tranching also gets affected because every by, uh, part of the security is going to be affected the same way. And so that again. Uh, 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 is uh, mm, came under cloud once this happened. F fourth is purchase of securitized pool. Not the you and I as individuals didn't purchase this. These were bought by institutions, including uh, banks, and they went by the ratings of the S and P uh, and uh, Moody's, Fitch, etc., which ranked the high tranche uh, the. Uh, securities as triple A, meaning they are liquid, uh, uh, highly liquid, and they are low risk. But it turned out, uh, I am told, and if this is true, uh, it will be a criminal neglect on the part of the rating agency. They did not, in their doing the rating, they did not even uh, envisage the possibility the housing prices will go down, go south, let alone uh, collapsing in the way they collapsed. If they did that in the uh, rating, then they were criminally negligent. But that's another matter. So the pr process of doing all this was complex. So nobody knew, even the most sophisticated holders of these uh, securities didn't know what the ultimate uh, the mortgage holder was on the whose mortgage the securities they were buying was based. So all that. And it created incentive problems all down the road. I'll take only one because uh, I want to have time for discussion. Now, uh, think of the old-fashioned mortgage. You went to a neighborhood bank. Uh, you entered into a, a mortgage contract. Before they gave the loan, they did a check uh, about your credit worthiness, about uh, all your potential uh, uh, capability of servicing the mortgage once the mortgage has been signed. And they held the mortgage until maturity. So that was the old-fashioned mortgage. Now, it has nice incentive property. Ex ante, the bank had the incentive to do a proper vetting so that uh, uh, you uh, they chose only the most creditworthy of uh, the potential applicants for the mortgage to give a mortgage loan. Second. Once the mortgage has been signed, 
they had an interest in monitoring how you are doing and if uh, for reasons beyond your control you were in difficulty the bank and you uh, had a common interest in accommodating in adjusting uh, to the change circumstances in some way for example if worst comes to worst if the uh, foreclosure possibility loom large then the bank had an interest not to let the uh, house go in fore foreclosure and lose value but divide up the loss between the borrower and itself in some fashion so the incentives were there to address uh, uh, problems uh, appropriately etc all this went over if you are going to originate the mortgage if you are going to sell it off the moment you have signed the mortgage contract to the spoo organizer the originating bank has no interest in first of all in vetting uh, uh, its borrowers and uh, let alone uh, more the monitoring because the mortgage is gone out of the bank's hand and so on down the down the road so this securitization and pooling created a whole bunch of incentive uh, mess up so that was the story of the uh, uh, financial crisis now how did it, uh, the how did india and china fare now i have start uh, in the indian case the perception as of mid 19 uh, mid 2008 where uh, already the uh, uh, price bubble had collapsed in the us and the problems were visible in the us market now so you could think of uh, ch uh, the financial channel is one way of spreading of the contagion to india the other could be the real channel that is to say india's export growth is uh, uh, affected by the uh, global uh, recession and particularly recession in the us which is one of the largest markets uh, uh, the largest market as a matter of fact for india's exports okay so there are real and financial channels now mr reddy the governor of india central bank reserve bank of india in his speech in mid 2008 he said the financial channel through the financial channel india is not going to experience a crisis because there is no credit derivatives market in india and the his institution namely reserve bank of india has been wise enough to control uh, uh, investment by indian residents on derivatives issued by abroad or even capital flows uh, abroad and the prudential policies of the reserve bank have ensured in his view a sound financial system particularly banking system now he didn't mention that i will mention to you 75% of the assets of the indian uh, commercial banks are owned by who the government so it's a public sector based uh, uh, banking system so the question of free capitalization of banks that is a problem in the united states doesn't arise the banks were owned by the uh, government so whenever the government wants to recapitalize they can just recon the the uh, do the recapitalization and the indian government had done that for some of the banks even earlier so uh, that that's an important aspect of the indian banking system so uh, ready uh, did not uh, mention anything at all uh, about the real channel now reddy's term had come to an end his successor uh, uh, duvuri rao uh, uh, who took over from him gave a speech in october again on the same issue uh, once uh, of course he de de debunked the decoupling uh, fad it's not feed uh, it is also a feed it fed on but anyway uh, decoupling fad and he reiterated also indian banks uh, uh, were sound uh, um, but he began he recognized there is uh, the contagion through financial flow financial channel that is occurring uh, uh, in the the contagion is spreading to india this happened because uh, foreign institutional investment flows into the indian equity markets began uh, the collapsing and that meant what uh, 
the Indian corporate sector uh, which was dependent in part on cheaper uh, foreign uh, uh, the capital uh, now faced a problem that capital uh, for uh, the working capital or whatever through the global depository receipts etc that uh, uh, the f channel was uh, stopped so what that meant is they have to find credit somewhere so that shifted to the increased demand for the uh, in the domestic credit market so he recognized the financial channel through many ways the other one is the trade credit so that also uh, uh, melted uh, down significantly and so this uh, uh, had an impact so uh, this will affect the exchange rate as well because uh, the capital flows are in foreign exchange the credit is uh, the is going to be spent on rupees etc and so that affects the exchange rate uh, the exchange real exchange rate affects the exports and uh, the real channel through reduction in export growth he said it is relevant but he didn't expect that to be uh, uh, quantitatively significant because uh, india's uh, exports as a share of gdp was less than uh, 20% not uh, 22 or 23% and so he didn't expect that to be uh, uh, significant but he expected the financial channel to be more important because india had become uh, more integrated in the financial sector I'll, in a moment you'll see the magnitudes uh, than uh, in the real side goods and services export side and so the, the economy the uh, the impact was seen in gdp growth growth of industry and manufacturing export growth and of course the indian central bank and then the indian government also introduced its own stimulus packages and the central bank like uh, the federal reserve reduced interest rates and did all the usual monetary policy thing is to uh, address the recession now the one difference with china is the share of consumption and investment demand in the indian expenditure uh, uh, particularly the consumption demand is much higher than the uh, share of consumption demand in the chinese gdp uh, and of course investment demand in both cases and china also the investment demand is important so uh, if you want to respond to the global shock uh, uh, on your exports so if export demand is going to melt down you have to substitute uh, a domestic demand now if already your consumption investment are a fairly high proportion of uh, domestic demand then that uh, option is that much less in the case of india than in the case of china now quantitatively uh, uh, the india uh, uh, had a very nice growth of over 9% from 2005 per year from 2005-6 to 2007-8 and earlier than that it was closer to uh, uh, somewhat lower but fell you know, rapid now many of us including uh, myself had argued this uh, rapid rate of growth was not sustainable because of uh, domestic constraints particularly infrastructure any of you who know about the indian infrastructure whether it is roadways railways uh, power electricity etc you know what kind of a, a constraint the real infrastructure is then the uh, the social infrastructure in terms of education uh, health etc are uh, also not in an ideal shape so the growth uh, of the 9% and odd would not have been sustainable had to come down anyway if the infrastructure problems are not going to be addressed quickly and uh, so financial crisis or not indian growth would have gone down whether it would have gone down as much uh, as and as quickly is another matter so anyway uh, the the financial year that ended in march of 2009 about a month ago 
the growth rate is they projected to be just six uh, percent. Uh, and the third quarter of 2008-2009, uh, it had fallen to 5.3. Uh, uh, the we, uh, official agencies had projected for 2008-2009 7.1%, but that is unlikely to be achieved. It's more likely to be around 6 to 6.3%. And next year, IMF projects the growth rate and others project the growth rate to go down even further. So the growth impact has been significant. Now, uh, the, if you break down the growth, the GDP growth into the one of the sectors which have been uh, very important in the outsourcing and uh, uh, related matter, the services, financial insurance and real estate, that uh, uh, which had been growing at 12% or so is expected now uh, uh, to be around 9%. Manufacturing growth was negative in the third quarter of 2008-2009 and that is also going to be lower. Value of exports declined by 22% in the third quarter of uh, the last financial year and foreign exchange reserves uh, India's fell by 57 billion dollars now it's around 255 dollars billion dollars how many of you know what is china's foreign exchange reserves anybody yes close to 1.1.95 trillion dollars in the first quarter okay now india share in world exports this comes back to the other question about how closely India was integrated in the real markets. India's share uh, in global exports uh, has grown very slowly. It is now only 1.1% of global exports, as you will see in a moment compared to China's. Now, uh, so the goods and services integration uh, if you take the gross flows of exports and imports, it's about 45% of GDP. Uh, financial integration, uh, taking current account and capital in account into account, is 117% of GDP. So India is far more integrated financially than it is on the real side. And so the financial channel, which Mr. Reddy thought isn't going to be important, it turns out to be significant. The foreign exchange, the uh, stock exchange meltdown uh, uh, in the Bombay uh, uh, stock exchange is clear and also market capitalization that also uh, has uh, declined. Now what about China? China as I said far more integrated than India both in financial and real flows. So uh, and the scope of domestic demand expansion I said is much higher than in India. But however, China is investing at about close to 50% of GDP and much of this investment is inefficient compared to China. So uh, any further push up of investment uh, as a share of GDP in China will run into the uh, efficiency I I barrier consideration. You know, uh, it, this is, uh, I don't have the time to go into why China's uh, uh, investment uh, is less efficient and there is um, uh, a work by, uh, I forget his name, Kao Sheng from uh, and Kana at uh, uh, the business school at Harvard, Kao Sheng is from MIT, uh, who document uh, uh, the China's corporate sector, corporate governance, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, compared to India's is far worse. And so this uh, expansion of investment in China uh, would be costly. Now, uh, I want to mention the, the recent speeches of the governor of, uh, in two minutes I'll conclude. We, uh, the uh, governor of, since I quoted Mr. Reddy and Mr. Rao, I should do equal justice and uh, uh, the talk about uh, uh, the recent speeches 
of the speeches of the governor of People's Bank of China. Before I do, now uh, real growth uh, uh, has, uh, uh, from the production side, uh, declined to six, six and a half percent this year, from about to 12 percent in 2007, and uh, uh, the real export growth uh, declined in the last two months by 17 percent to 25 percent. Remember from a 25-24% growth rate in 2005 of real exports to decline to 6% in 2009 is a major shock. And given uh, in a moment how much China is dependent on uh, exports. Foreign exchange reserves, we, you are the only one who knew the number. Here is 1.95 trillion, but some people project it's going to be 2.4 trillion before this year is out. Now, foreign capital inflows, China gets far more than India does. Uh, share in world exports. I said India had a 1% share. China has a close to 9% share. China is the second largest exporter in the world. Within a year or two, it will be the world's largest merchandise exporter. The commercial services China share is less 3.7%. India's is 2.7, but in the goods and services, integration goods and services is 65 percent compared to 45 percent for India. Financial integration, 134, 33 percent compared to 117 percent for China. And China's savings, domestic savings, is uh, 49 percent of GDP. India's is about 33, 34 percent of GDP. China's investment I have already talked about. Shanghai Composite Index, that has also collapsed. And uh, uh, capitalization, uh, market capitalization uh, uh, is uh, uh, also. Uh, you see the difference between India and China uh, in the market capitalization. This has a lot to do with the inefficiency of the corporate uh, governance and other parts uh, of the uh, Chinese economy. That's why it was a slow growth in the ca market capitalization. Now, turning to the governor's uh, speech, he addressed uh, one issue which many American uh, writers uh, uh, they focus on, namely China uh, uh, is running uh, current account surpluses and uh, U.S. Uh, is uh, running current account uh, deficits. Chi uh, U.S. is borrowing uh, uh, from China uh, uh, a lot of money. And how is it by borrowing? Uh, the Chinese are holding uh, U.S. treasuries and other uh, dollar-denominated assets, primarily government assets. So that's the story. Now. The U.S. writers accuse China of uh, uh, lots of crimes. One is currency manipulation. Two, they save too much, uh, and they don't invest as much. And so they have to, uh, to uh, send their excess savings abroad. Third, they, uh, they ma the manipulation of exchange rate keeps the renminbi dollar exchange rate low, so that uh, uh, that encourages export growth and so on. So uh, those, you are all young people, those who have a longer memory would know the same charges were made by the Americans uh, against Japan not so long ago. Japanese save too much, Japanese don't invest as much, Japanese uh, uh, are holding uh, uh, the lending to the Americans. The uh, I didn't give the Japanese uh, uh, the foreign exchange reserves. How much are they? you know, same order of the Chinese or so. So they are also holding a huge bunch of, uh, so that's, and he, uh, Mr. Uh, Shua Chen, uh, I won't be pronouncing his name correctly, the governor of uh, uh, Central Bank, he said, look, the savings and investment decisions, uh, quite a large part are determined by households, a number of things have happened. Uh, for one thing, Culturally, East Asians and others save uh, much more than they do compared to the uh, American households. Second, uh, the social security system 
uh, uh, in China, which was dependent upon earlier on state owned enterprises and enterprises had collapsed. And so, people had to depend on their own uh, uh, savings for their future retirement and health care expenses and so on. So, they had to save more, etc. So, there are a number of real factors which uh, not uh, the willful uh, the trying to the uh, affect the Americans as a motive for the Chinese extra savings. So, he went through very carefully. And then, he also had a number of things to say about uh, the reforms of the global financial system. And he uh, was particularly concerned about the fact the dollar uh, is the uh, uh, global reserve, reserve currency. What does it mean? The Federal Reserve can print dollars and everybody else uh, cannot print dollars. So, if uh, dollar is a global reserve currency, US gets senior age by uh, the uh, printing of the dollars. Second, the, if the US monetary policy is run on domestic objectives, primarily domestic objectives of unemployment, etc., then uh, as a global reserve currency provider, it can't respond to what the global demand for liquidity or global demands are there. So, he argued that the currency global reserve currency should be shifted away from the dollar to let us say the uh, SDR or created by IMF or what have you. So, that is the second part of governor's uh, speech. Now, uh, basically uh, is this a crisis of capitalism? It is all nonsense. Forget about all this feverish talk about the uh, crisis of global capitalism, etc. That always happens whenever there is a crisis. If you want to blame some system, it is a nice way to blame it as a capitalist system because you can define your capitalist system in your own way and then uh, put the blame on to the global capitalist system. That uh, ought to be uh, dismissed out of hand. What is more relevant is the systemic risk management. Now, it is not just the risks for individual participants in the market. How does the whole financial system uh, risk is being managed? And that is where uh, there is various proposals or where to draw the line between regulation and leaving into the market is to be done. And the Europeans want to do much more on the regulatory side than the, the American authorities want to do. But one should remember one thing, as I said, even the dimensions of the crisis are not fully known. A thorough causal analysis of the crisis is yet to be done. Now, if we make reform proposals based on half-baked understanding of what was the, uh, the contributory, what were the contributory causes causally and with a not a complete understanding of the crisis itself, uh, then uh, you might do harm from a longer term perspective, either by uh, uh, increasing the probability of a future crisis even more than what it would otherwise have been, or, uh, and also coping some policy options that would have been otherwise available. So, you have to be cautious about uh, reforming the system. I will stop there.